<laughs> Redirecting. I'm, I'm all hoop out up today. <laughs> all the hoops in town. Uh huh. <laughs> right on, everybody. I just want to welcome you to the uh, second part of the Two Feathers Food Sovereignty Series. Um, if you came and if you tuned in for the first time, we made some applesauce with Megan Baldy. Uh, she'll be here today. We got a few other illustrious guests. We have Jude Marshall of Potawat Gardens. We have Mar Marva Jones of the Talua Dini Nation, and we have Mr. Donald Moore, uh, Yurok tribal member. And uh, along with my co-host Shoshone Hostler, um, we're coming to you live to that today to talk a little bit more in depth about what food sovereignty means in our community, um, to our local indigenous people here on the North Coast um, of California. And before we get started with introductions and everything, because I want everybody to have a chance to introduce themselves a little bit further, um, I just wanted to go ahead and take like a moment, um, moment in silence, you know, so that way we can kind of all pray in our own way and, um, you know, send some good thoughts and some, some good healing to, to the land, to the people that are affected, um, to the firefighters that are out there on the front line, you know, it's, it's crazy times right now. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, as Native people, that's what we do. We pray, you know, and we're not afraid to pray. And so I want to take a take that moment of silence so that we can all pray in our own way. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, you know, that's, as we talk about food sovereignty, I think it's important that we, you know, we talk about the land and right now our land is hurting, you know, and that's like kind of a, a direct reflection of our lack of, um, you know, ability to maintain the land in the way that we know how, you know, as indigenous people. And so I wanted to just take that second and acknowledge that, you know, because we're talking about food sovereignty today. And so we have to talk about the land, you know, and the land and the, we could, uh, that's what provides for us, the land, the waters, the rivers, the oceans, and so on. I th felt it was very important. Um, so, so Shoshone, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. And Yeah, thank you, Bubba. Um, I think it is really important. And at Two Feathers, we're trying to tie in themes. We're trying to um, talk about the best way to move forward with healing our communities. And, you know, part of being a mental health therapist is acknowledging um you know people people's needs their basic needs and also like more complex needs too right and i think food kind of speaks to both of those things um it helps us you know be able to um not stress in in the moments um where food a food shortage is like a really big issue in in those families and then also it helps us to preserve and give back in a good way to our community when we have an abundance of food that we've prepared and we've put prayer into. And so um, that self-actualization on a higher level, I think it speaks to uh, mental health in, in many different ways. Um, so that's what we were really interested in, getting everybody kind of involved in, and also promoting the people who are doing it in our communities already and highlighting your guys' gifts and knowledge um, for our families and community members. So thank you guys for um, for coming on here with us. All right, Mr. Marshall, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, how's it going? Uh, my name is Jude Marshall. I'm Hoopa, Kaduk, and Yura. I'm the community nutrition manager at United Indian Health Services in the Potawatt Community Food Garden, which is a three acre organic, organically grown garden that we provide uh, healthy food for the nine tribes under UIHS. We do a lot of uh, workshops around uh, food self-sufficiency and uh, we, uh, we provide our food at affordable costs for our clients in our community. 
I'm a family man, you know, my wife, uh, like, you know, give her kudos. She really supports me in the work that I do. And my children, uh, Hazel, Yamich, and Kavish. Um, just thinking about it this morning and, and the work that we're doing, thinking about the future and uh, what, what we want to leave for them, uh, you know. So just like the work that we're doing, everybody here, you know, the work that we're doing is really important. And I really want to thank everybody out there who's doing work around food sovereignty, you know, the work healing the land, fighting for our rivers, uh, the ones that are trying to bring back fire in our community. It's all, it's all related. So, um, yeah. Take it away, Marva. Um, I am Talawa, Yurok, um, Karuk, and Wintun. Um, I was raised on the Smith River at the village of Neely Chendon. Um, that's my maternal family. I have three beautiful children, Chesky, Nansen, and Teheshe. Um, they're my life joy. Um, I work with the California Kitchen at Ahupa. Um, we're a social justice and environmental justice network. Um, in our community to reclaim food sovereignty as well. Um, we have a number of projects that we work on. Um, protecting our environment is one of the main things that we do. Um, I enjoy um, harvesting and eating our traditional foods and I look forward to today. Thank you for inviting me and I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you for being here. And live from Durango, Colorado, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Hi, um Aikwe, Nek Now, Dal Moore, um Chalkik Essi Turup Mate Wumetrok. Um my mother is Stephanie Weldon and my father is Glenn Moore. Um so yeah, um my name is Dal Moore. I'm in my fourth year of school at uh, Fort Lewis College um, in Durango, Colorado. I'm currently in Durango right now. We just got some snow. Um so it's kind of cold right now. We did have smoke from back home, from back from California here as well. Um, I'm going to school for environmental studies, I'm kind of focusing more on natural resources and food systems. So I'm going to get this, I think it's some type of food certificate. I forgot the exact name, but it's pretty much kind of what we're going to be talking about. Um, I love food. I love talking about this. I was nervous um, leading up to this and I was talking to my friend. He's like, well, um, why are you nervous if you talk about it all the time, like to me and stuff? I was like, okay, yeah, true. It just can be a conversation, but I'm excited to be here and I was um, really honored to be asked to be a part of this. So thank you. All right, on. thank you for joining us and thank you for coming back, Megan. I wanted to give you a chance to speak again. Hey, everybody. My name is Megan Baldy. I'm um, the district coordinator for the Klamath Trinity Resource Conservation District here in Hoopa, California. I am a Hoopa tribal member as well. And food security, these, these conversations around food is super important to me. I live it, I breathe it, um, not only because I believe it's so important to our community, but I also have six kids and all those kids can eat. And so, you know, when it comes to food security and food sovereignty, that's one of the, the main topics in my home is what's for breakfast, what's for dinner, what's for lunch, all that is going on on a, on a minute to minute hourly basis and you know just being a part of it as a family is super awesome but you know definitely like uh, sharing those gifts outside of our home and into our community um, I also appreciate that my family my kids are super passionate about food security and they like to share all that stuff too as well so I'm happy to be on this panel awesome people here thank you guys for having me again I really appreciate two feathers for doing this and thank you for coming back. You know, it's kind of the, the goal of our series as a whole to, uh, you know, to highlight what it means, you know, here in our local communities. Um, you know, and we also want to uplift not only, you know, our ind individual food sovereignty resources, but, you know, as a community as well. And so um, our first part, we explored on how to make some applesauce and how to preserve apples. It's a great time of year because there's all kinds of apples all over the place and you don't even need the best kind either that's kind of what we learned the last time too um we're gonna in our future episodes we're gonna go forward and you know look at the different traditional foods of our area um we have planned 
a talk and presentation about acorns and the and the meaning of those in our in our local community um, with Miss Marva and also uh, a guest um, guest speaker with, with Bertha Peters. And so um, we're going to do an episode on deer meat, on berries, um, just a different. We're going to try to make it as seasonal as possible, right? Um, and so just to highlight the different the different foods that we use and you know utilize at the different times of year um so to get started today i wanted to ask you guys and we can go one at a time this can be a conversation whatever kind of fits best but uh what food sovereignty means to you guys like as an individual and then in, in your role professionally um whatever that means to you what you know what is food sovereignty I guess I'll go first. Um, to me, it means everything, you know, uh, to be truly sovereign. I feel like with, with our tribes, we need to have, uh, we need to be food sovereign. We need to have control of our food system. If we can't feed ourselves, then uh, what are we doing? You know, we, we're, we're seeing that now with, with the crisis with COVID, with these wildfires, having to bring in food. So the more that we can control our own food system, the better. And that, that all comes from the, you know, from the family, you know, working with your neighbor, then working with your tribe, your, your neighboring communities, and then your neighboring tribes. I think, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, the tribes, we all traded with each other. We, we depended on each other. So anytime, you know, if, an, if our neighboring tribe is getting better on food, you know, strengthen their food sovereignty, that's also going to help the whole, this whole region. So yeah, it's like strengthening uh, the food web one strand at a time, I like to say. And everybody has a part, you know, if you're growing your home garden, if you're, you're you're gleaning, if you're working at a community garden, if you're hunting and fishing, if you're, you know, fighting for the water, that, that all relates to food sovereignty. So, um, there's not one person that's going to be able to solve or bring food sovereignty, but if we do it as a as a unit and together, I think we're all. I really do believe this area. Everybody, we're going in that direction to be food sovereign. So it's really exciting uh, to seeing all all the tribes has some sort of focus around uh, food security and, and food sovereignty. I, I can go next. Um, food sovereignty to me means uh, building relationship, like what uh, Jude was just saying. It's a continuing our relationship and it's strengthening our people um, in, the, in the best healing modes possible. Um, food connections offers us not just sustenance for our nutrition, but it's a deliberate relationship between place and food. I mean, it's a, it's our source. It's, a, it's it's all of it. Like Jude was saying, it brings us balance, uh, and it's the importance of showing respect for those things that we harvest. It gives us meaning. Um, it gives us identity. It gives us opportunity to expand um, our heart, our fitness. Um, our overall understandings of our ancestral knowledge and values that go into these foods. And so to me, it's um, ensuring that our babes acquire a taste for these foods as well, you know, for seaweed, for acorns, sea anemone, you know, dried fish. I mean, those are things that we wanna make sure continue on into the future with our, with our youth. And so that's what food sovereignty to me is. So I'd like to echo definitely both uh, Jude and, and Marva's points about food sovereignty. And, you know, definitely to me, what food sovereignty means is I always ask people at that, that, that bottom level, what is food security to you? And I always just kind of put it into context is like, do you have five days worth of food at your home? Do you have three days worth of food at your home? Do you have two days worth of food at your home? You know, I'm breaking it down because we are living in a time with this pandemic. I think it's like showing that, that we really need to become more food secure within individual homes. But I think also, you know, we've known for a long time that we needed to get prepared for these types of things because, you know, we could very well go through a winter season and all of our roads slide out. And, you know, we have people that are trapped. And for me, you know, I want to make sure that um, people within our community have that kind of mentality of a five food day type of thinking because we need to make sure that that is um, something that we're do that everybody understands so that we do not have starving people that we can't get to 
Now I always put that food security on that individual level, food sovereignty being everybody it has that ability to do that, that everybody in that community is that sovereign with food and that we don't have to worry, you know? I mean, a couple of years back, we had a really rough snowstorm and I found out that a couple elders didn't have food. And so I went to them to get them food, but the situation in their home was so dire and so scary that I was fearful that they were even gonna make it through the night. One, their lights were out, they didn't have a generator and their whole home depended on electric heat. Two, their whole porch was iced over. They were literally trapped within their home because they're elders and they couldn't walk outside onto that ice. And then their, their water depended on electricity. So, you know, we have these very people within our communities that suffer during these times and we need to think about those things and, and worry about those things because if they're sovereign, if they're safe, our elders and our children, our most vulnerable population, then we can, we can start to see that we're more food sovereign. I'll add on to that. Um, um, yeah, thank you, Megan. I was, I was going to talk about food security too, but um, uh, yeah, um, food sovereignty to me is a lot, um, a lot also um, to be sovereign to me means like be able to um, kind of not necessarily control, but able to have that um, power to do something. So, and with all sovereign things, you have to, to be able to take care of it. Otherwise it won't be, you won't be sovereign no more. So like Marvo was saying, we have to take care of our environment. And so we can continue this. That means, and that goes for all levels. That means when you're fishing by yourself, that means as a tribe, we need to um, protect our rivers as, forestry people we need to manage our acorns and all that and whether all levels we need to um, take care of our land and then this food security and sovereignty it's mental it's physical it's um, emotional and um, health it's i i think um i always say this but i think food security and this subject we're talking about right now is the single most important thing in society in my opinion just because of all the different things that it, it helps and can lead to. So, you know, I was watching this movie um, for, a, we showed a movie actually two years ago at the Environmental Center. It was talking about kids that are hungry during um, school. They're, um, they're not focusing really about what's being taught in front of them. They're, I know in certain times when I'm hungry and stuff, I could just feel my stomach and I'm worried about like, shoot, when am I gonna eat? When am I gonna eat? And so when you're doing that, you're not learning then, um, I don't know. There's a lot of different things about food, but I, um, I, I, like I said, I think it's the most important thing because, you know, um, this summer I ate pretty good, but the summer before the last, I was working out a lot. I was eating salmon. I was eating berries. I was eating stuff from the garden every day from whether it be uh, Megan's garden or at Potawat or um, my mom's garden at home. I was feeling really good. And it was like a really, my well being was there. You know, I, um, that was like the all-time high, you know, you just, I just felt great, woke up, I wanted to wake up, so like that, that just goes to show you, and that's a small example, you know, um, all these other things, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, I think just food is very special, like, um, Jude always puts in my head, food is, food is medicine, really, and it, it really should be, it, there's, we have so many of these um, illnesses and stuff that, instead of taking medicine, I, I was starting to go in this, um, the summer of, trying to I want to prescribe a diet I don't want to prescribe someone you know here's some um, oxycontin and this for your bad or this and that like giving these narcotics I'd rather um, here you go here's a diet and here's your here's um, a, and we'll provide you um, with all of it from our farmer's market and I think that instead of having someone live longer they'll it'll extend their life instead of someone keeping them alive longer that's it, I don't want to be kept alive longer I want to live be able to exceed that so um yeah i, I want to see where else this conversation goes because i could talk for a long time but um yeah food sovereignty and security is my number one concern right now i just want to add to that real quick uh like you know, like donald said uh, it's kind of what really got me into food is when i when i changed my diet you know i about 10 10 plus years ago when uh my daughter was was born. Um, I gained that daddy weight, they call it, 
and I just wasn't feeling good. And, and then I kind of changed my diet to kind of be more of an ancestral diet, you know, I cut out some of these, these uh, modern foods, industrialized foods that my body wasn't, you know, taking very well, the dairy, the grains, the processed foods, I cut those out and I increased, you know, my vegetables, I, I ate more salmon, I ate, you know, my greens and and I just felt my, my body changed, my, my attitude, everything changed. And that transformation really did really push me like, I don't really want to help. If I feel this change, I really want to help the native community um, get more access to these healthy foods so they can they can feel that transformation as well. And then hope that that spreads to, to other people. I really appreciate everybody's answers on here. I think that was a really beautiful collection to like give to the audience because somebody's going to pick something out from everybody um, that, that, that resonates with. And I want to ask you guys, how do you guys personally practice food sovereignty to give people like ideas of what they can do in their own lives or um, professional ways in which they can engage also with organizations and other um, businesses to have um, that connection on the deeper level too. So um, kind of combining food security and the, the concept of food sovereignty together and, and how it, does it look practice. And um, maybe uh, Donald can start and then we can um, work the, the opposite way for this question. Okay. Um, yeah, um, ways I practice food sovereignty and um, implement it. Um, so I think for sovereignty, first off, it starts, so if we're talking about sovereignty, I think it first off starts with um, making your own choices. So I seen like what um, um, Jude was saying this year, I, I think it was due to COVID, but it, I seen a lot of people start gardens. You know, my dad started a garden. Um, my mom got a greenhouse. I seen almost every cousin start a garden and that's beautiful to see. And so I, I really like that and I hope that continues because it's, it's nice to, um, to want something or like for a, a zucchini to be ready and you don't even have to go even hop in your car to get a zucchini. It's nice to have like stuff to make you, it's, I think it's just crazy where you could just plant some, a bunch of seeds in the ground and a couple, if you, as long as you take care of it, um, a couple months later, you have a, a Costco trips worth of food and for a very little amount return. And like I said, uh, that mental well-being goes into that. But other ways I um, insert it is I like, I think I'm more about the education right now, like um, just kind of um, talking about it with whether it be my friends or other people that are passionate about, or um, I'll know I had, um, every time my friend, um, I would go to my friends over the summer. I would just talk, just go on and on about nutrition, and they probably got annoyed of, of me. But I think if they could pick something from that, then that's all I want. I want. I think food security isn't just giving, or sovereignty isn't just giving someone here you go, here's vegetables. Food security is giving them a recipe, telling them how to grow it, telling them the different ways to cook it, and nutritious ways. Um, food security is teaching someone how to make a net not just giving them fish. I, that's a part of it, but I think it's the whole part of that. Food security is Megan's workshop classes instead of someone giving them a jar of fish. Teach them how to make a jar of fish or how to catch a fish, smoke it, and can it. So then they they could do that themselves. They just You just need to give them that education. Food security is, um, I don't know, it's a lot. So like, I don't, um, whenever I get asked like what food security means to me, um, it's not necessarily like you're starving or you're like you're not eating. It just means you don't know exactly where your meal, next meal is going to come from. You don't know if you could eat tonight, but you don't. I don't. You don't know if you're going to eat tonight. Like in college, there was a few times where like when I'm at home at mom's, you know, I could go walk into the fridge, eat something, um, then go sit back down, whether it be nutritious or not. But in college or um, when you're away from home, it's a little bit different because. You know, you don't have that um, family there to cook you, cook for you. Sometimes you're fi financially unstable. So it's learn finding those resources, um, getting, and the, oh, this is also food security, like teaching someone how to fill out a SNAP application, getting them a ride. A um, um, few years ago uh, at a health fair when I was working with Megan, 
I would, I'd made this assessment and I found a lot of the people, I know it's only the people that came up and took the survey, but a lot of people, they're female and they're young females in our Hoopa and native communities that are food insecure. These are probably single mothers. These are people that are probably struggling. And so a lot of the people, when they put their um, barrier to get um, about SNAP, it was a lot of people didn't even know how to do it. A lot of people didn't know or didn't have transportation. It wasn't really the other barriers. It was like stuff that as long as you teach them, they can have $200 worth of food on their card um, a month, which is better than nothing. So um, yeah, like, and yeah, like I was trying to, sorry for jumping around, but in college, like, you know, sometimes you're on your own. Sometimes you don't know if you're going to eat. Sometimes you, all you have is the unhealthy meal plan or enough to, a couple dollars to get on um, to get like a, something from the value menu and so like that's not really a good time but it was um, but I got into these food programs and just learned more learned that there is resources out here that are almost everywhere you just have to find them um, um, get involved a little bit more um, so I don't know food security means a lot like if, um, I'm able to eat salmon here in Colorado not that I buy it here but because I can it, I can some eels. I have a lot of jam, so like um, I really am really am passionate about like the education part of it. Um, our native foods. Um, I like I said, I think this is the most important thing because, like I said earlier, the first three years of a child's life is their, their nourish their nourishment is very important. Meaning, if if these if your children are eating like say like you know Pepsi and eating some stuff they shouldn't be at that age, that could cause a lot of long term effects. Meaning. The kid could have short attention spans. They could they could overeat when they they could um, not eat a lot. They could have ADHD, and so that's one portion. It's I think um, food security, being constantly fed with nutrition food. Like I said, I felt better by myself. So I think that's suicide rates. It covers. It helps with suicide rates. It helps with um, high school graduation rates. It helps you stay in school. I think if you're fed right um you think better you know um and so and then add the getting help or going to the garden me and my dad always i are after um talking to him about garnies oh man is this kind of like therapy i'm like yeah like you're talking to the plants and they're like providing back with you so like it's all it's all complex i think for security but in the same way it's everything is connected everything and so um environmental so um, I'm really excited. I'm pretty young in this field compared to um, my other panelists right now, but I love learning and I love, I'm always down to teach. And if I can't teach you, then I'll, I can refer you to something or someone. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Megan, do you want to go next? Sure. So yeah, the um, probably the, the most uh, thing that I think about when I think about uplifting the food security work that I'm doing is just my own personal experience. I came from a large family. Um, my dad combined with my stepmom, they had about eight kids and, you know, I was the oldest daughter and, you know, there was times when my dad would go to work in Hoopa and he would be in the woods for for weeks and months at a time, you know, and then I would, I would be there with my brothers and sisters and not to give my stepmom a bad name, but, you know, she wasn't really there as a mom. And so um, we were really hungry. And I would just remember my dad coming home and he's like, and I'd be like, dad, we're hungry. We're starving. We haven't eaten in days. And he'd be like, she didn't cook for you. And we'd be like, no, like we're, we're hungry. And I just remember at eight years old, my dad took me into the kitchen and I started the um, pill and potatoes and he said you're never going to let your brothers and sisters uh, starve again and just coming back to that you know as a kid and and knowing that there are multiple kids out there in our community that are like that you know that they don't have uh, possibly an adult or somebody in their life or maybe the adult in their life doesn't even know how to cook um, and so there's a lot of kids that are really out there just not having food and so you know, when I first started this work, um, I didn't know anything about gardening, except for I could go into the garden that my husband grew, take a salt shaker and eat tomatoes and cucumbers and, you know, life was good.
but then I started working for this program and they threw me into the garden manager position. And I was like, I don't know how to grow anything, guys. What are you, what are you guys doing to me? And, you know, at that time, there was a community school right next to the garden. And um, I talked to a bunch of farmers and I was like, uh, I mean, I feel like if I grow anything, I'm just going to kill it. They're like, grow pumpkins. Like, you can do pumpkins, Megan. There's a big seed. They're pretty resilient. They, you know, you'll be able to do it. I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. And so I got kindergartners over there and we started planting a bunch of pumpkins. The next day that the pumpkins were almost ready, um, I went to the garden and all the pumpkins were smashed. Tomatoes were thrown apart. I was like, oh my goodness, these kids next door, they destroyed all these pumpkins. So I walked over to the school and I went in there and I confronted them all. And I said, you know, how could you guys do that to these babies as pumpkins over there? And like, you know, kind of like, just kind of shame on you guys. That was not okay. And they put their head down, you know, they knew that, that what they did was wrong. They understood that. So I went back over to the garden. I was like, I could lock this place up um, or, the, or I can, you know, call the cops on them or whatever, but they just scaled the fence if I locked it, you know, it's not like it would keep them out or they would, they've already been dealing with cops and stuff every time they've done stuff. I said, I'm gonna get them over to the garden. I'm gonna make them take ownership of it. So I got them over there. They started building boxes. They, I mean, we had power tools with them and, you know, hammers and stuff. It was pretty scary at times, but I had a really good support system with the school um, um, one of the principals of the school actually helped do it. So we were like putting the other boxes and then we started growing stuff and, you know, they grew eggplant there. And I said, you guys are going to eat this eggplant. They're like, no way, Megan, there's no way I won't do it there. I will not eat eggplant. I was like, you guys can do it. I know we can. They're like, no, I was like, well, you guys grew this stuff. And so you got to eat it. You're native, yo, you have to eat this. I, I, that's just that's just who we are. So I was like, okay, so I got over there and, and I got pizza toppings because I know pizza toppings on anything makes it taste good. And so I taught them how to make eggplant pizza sliders. And those kids were having like thirds and fourths of eggplant. So I think those kind of stories with kids and youth and, and them being able to do something with their own hands and their own ability, I feel like that's a, a good push to why I do what I do. I mean, there's those moments of that connection, you know, when we go out and we gather and we fish and stuff and, you know, we open those jars and those goodies and stuff. I think about who I was with at that time. When we ate that eggplant, I was thinking about those kids and everything that we've been through to that journey, connection to that food. You know, that's kind of what we're missing a lot of. So that's kind of like the reason why I do it, because I want to see that connection and how food brings people together in a positive way. Um, how I practice and uplift food sovereignty and um, sustainability is through sharing. Um, whenever I harvest throughout the year, I always share with elders. And if there's someone who hits me up and was like, man, I'm really hungry for some eels or fish or seaweed or something or berries or whatever I have available, um, I'll share it. So uh, it's an important part of giving back to our community and uh, whatever I've learned over the years, I pass that to my children and those are who are interested. So I've taken people out and harvesting tea and different things, seaweed, and um, it's a good way to build community. Um, we grew up with a huge garden. Um, in my lifetime, I couldn't believe my grandparents could manage the garden sizes they had even after work. And so I was telling my kids the other day, I go, I was forced to have to, you know, weed the garden or, or water the garden or harvest before I could go swimming. And I was like, man, I'm going to go do this. I was, when I was younger, I didn't really appreciate it as much. And so now as an adult, I'm so thankful that I was taught how to can and how to produce um, a garden and then you know, actually uh, going out and harvesting our traditional foods and, and stuff as well. And so I want to keep that as a thing that my kids carry on in their families and the people, the lives that I'm able to share with and have it be something that it's not even a thought, a second thought about, you know, you're gonna be, this is what you do. It's a deliberate relationship. And so I'm really thankful for that. Um, I, um, 
the continued importance of like everyone's uh, has already stated the connecting to land and water and our source and spirit is so healing. Like, like you said, when you go out to the garden, you're harvesting or you're weeding or something, it just really touches you back down to the land. And I feel like as a society, we're so absent in connection and relationship and touchdown. And we're made to like believe that these things that aren't even our values that are supposed to be our values are so foreign to what, how we practice and how we believe. And I really believe so strongly that we have to be that renewal and that reconnection and continuance of our ancestral teachings because it's so vital right now in um, the times that we're living, not just with the COVID, but just with where people put their hearts. I mean, like I want that passion in my kids' chest, which I see because my son was able to harvest all of our eels this year. I didn't have to trade for him. I didn't have to buy any or anything. I, had to, I My son was just so plentiful on the eels this year. So we can like 28 cases of eels. And so I was just like, man, this is so awesome. So we were able to share some through California Kitchen with the Hoopa community. We, we shared, you know, two cases of fish there. We shared two cases with the Wea elders and, and we shared our, um, our harvest of um, seaweed that we got. We got a lot of heat seaweed this year. And so I, we were able to give back to our communities and, and I just love being able to do that. So, and our dried fish, our dried fish is a big commodity because we were all dried, we all uh, harvested dried fish on the coast. And so we're able to share some back with some of the um, Yurok elders who have requested it this year. So I'm excited about that. And the places we have these things and the touchdown with earth, like the two weeks we used to camp on, on the beach to dry fish is powerful for our kids. It's, it's like, it's a total connection with like Don was saying, you don't just teach them, you don't just give them the, the final product. You're teaching them how to harvest and fish and make the, uh, the dip net themselves and to go out and gather mussels and to, you know, perch fish and stuff and then, then to process it down. And then we share it. We, we always share our fresh stuff right off the get go with elders in the community and people who have requested it. So that connection to community is so prevalent in food. I mean, that's our best way we share our love is through food. And so um, food sovereign to me is huge. I mean, obviously I'm a big girl, so you can tell that I've been eating, but I really want to be a thing that um, survives in our people and, and, and reconnects us back, back to earth. Yeah, I like what Marva uh, talked about on sharing and I just kind of was thinking, uh, you know, also sharing uh, using using the social media platform. I mean, that's kind of one way I, I do that too. Like sometimes I'll cook a healthy meal and I'll, I'll share it on my you know Instagram or Facebook, and I and I enjoy seeing when other people share their their when they're uh, doing their traditional food activities or when they're you know sharing a healthy meal. To me, that like also inspires and uplifts. Like oh, like I'll oh, see what see what Donald's doing over there. Like oh, like I want to make sure I, like, I'm I'm staying on it too, and then. You know, so sharing that knowledge through through the way uh, meeting our, our community where they're at, especially our youth, our youth are, you know, on you know with COVID and everything else, they're on on their phones or on the computers. So I think that's a really good way to uplift uh, food sovereignty, sharing those those food stories and everything around that. So maybe your journey on how you you caught your fish, um, but yeah, then sharing sharing the food itself. Um, you know, with the Potawatomi Community Food Garden, we we donate through to the ceremonies or any kind of um, anything going on native community if we have the food we get it out there and that's that's another way to uplift and, and just provide that, that access to our community and yeah sharing knowledge is the biggest thing though like like everybody was saying uh, you could teach teach them teach them how how to process the food how to catch it how to preserve it and then that that way you are acting you are promoting food sovereignty for your community Thank you guys for that. And I think the the social media one is a really big um, part of this. That's one thing that I really enjoy about Marva's posts is like seeing all of it like on a daily, um, weekly basis, reminding us that like, yeah, uh, this is going on. I need to be doing, you know, my gathering and putting away too. And just to see it on, on the timeline is a big deal. And I really appreciate that. Also a shout out to the Pottawa um, post too, cause I seen one on fertilizer and, you know, composting and that was really cool. So that got me stoked on my compost pile and, you know, thinking about the cost it'll save in soil and things next year. And I think Bubba's got um, the next question for our panel. Yeah, I liked, uh, I liked a lot of what you guys said, you know, 
kind of that connection to community, connection to the place, the physical fitness of it. Uh, I heard somebody, I think it was Marva mentioned earlier, you know, I, those are all the things that, you know, inspire me um, and, you know, motivate me, right, to, to continue on with this because it's, it's about the bigger picture like we're talking about, you know, it's not just about, you know, the food that we put into our body, it's like that bigger picture, that bigger connection, the food that we're using is actual medicine, right, and so uh, that medicine comes from our connection to our land connection to the people that have taught us um, and the ones that taught them, right? So there's another connection. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, you know, cause I, I view you guys all as like, as experts in the field, right? Um, no matter how experienced you are or not yet. Um, I w so I just want to know how you guys would suggest somebody to get started, you know, that kind of, kind of in the dark with some of this stuff what are what are some of the first steps maybe maybe a story from from early on in you guys's um lives you know and I, we've heard a couple already um so yeah so just some advice to people that are trying to get started i guess i'll go um yeah like like you're saying i mean you don't need to be an expert to start working towards food sovereignty or nutrition, just like doing the work, putting yourself, going to a, you can go to a local garden, volunteer, go to your family. Um, I mean, we, we have social media now. So if you do don't know how to do something, if you put it on Instagram or Facebook, you can be like, Hey, how do you can? I'm sure you'll have about 20 comments, people giving you advice. So there, the knowledge is out there. Uh, once you start doing the work too, people uh, will see that and they'll start, um, helping you out, you know, if they see you're doing the work. So just, just don't be afraid to get in there. I really like excited about Donald and, and, you know, I started kind of getting really into the food, like kind of towards the end of my uh, college career. And I'm really excited because he's like started, like when he started college, he kind of already knew that he wanted to get into food. So that like really like inspires me, like seeing the younger generation. I've seen that not only with Donald, but other, other, um, Native, Native young people uh, his age and, and younger are, are really taking uh, food really seriously and you know food security and food sovereignty. So just get in there, do the work. Um, I really, yeah, I'm really inspired by the young people who are out there fishing, you know, helping with the garden, hunting, gathering acorns. Uh, you know, Megan's son, he took the Master Food Preservers uh, course, you know, and that's awesome. I've even taken them at, I haven't taken the Master Food Preservers course yet. and. So, you know, when you're young, you have these opportunities, not saying you can't do it when you have a family, but when you're young, before you have kids, you have a lot of opportunity to learn, get these certifications, just putting yourself in, and gathering that knowledge so you can share it with your family and in, in the broader community. So that's, that's kind of the advice I say, just take, take this opportunity to learn as much as you can so you can share it out. Yeah, modeling. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Are you, no, you can go. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was just thinking about like to like our, our foods, our indigenous foods, like bringing them back as staples. Um, you know, I always like to tell people that, you know, when, you know, every day I'm asked, mom, what's for breakfast? Mom, what's for dinner? Mom, you know, what's for this? And, you know, I, I think about, you know, back in the day, moms that would probably have that same question and they would be like acorns and fish, acorns and berries, acorns and deer meat, acorns acorns and mushrooms, you know, those staples that were in our diets, you know, back in the day, just kind of starting to bring those back as like, not just, you know, you see them at dances or you see them at certain times of the year, or you bring them out when an elder needs it. You know, it's like every day, you know, seeing these foods, you know, and making sure that we're very connected to those um, food sources because you know, I, I agree with Jude, this younger generation, if they don't love our food, you know, are, is it, are they going to save it? Are they going to worry about it? You know, we need to make sure that they worry about those resources and that they're fully understanding that how important that food is to us, because we are very fortunate here. Um, if we were to have some sort of something go on in the world system, breakdown or whatever, we still have our acorns, we still have our roots, we still have our berries, you know, we have those things that are out there 
and they're free for the picking, you know, other communities, you know, they possibly, you know, might always think of apocalyptic kind of things, you know, people are to come up into our area and steal our food, they can't take that knowledge from our head, you know, they could steal our food, they could take our livestock or whatever, they still can't take that knowledge that's here, you know, and those are the things that we need to make sure that we're starting to bring back talking to our elders about how they were do things, you know, learning different things like we're very in, innovative people. If we see something that works easier, if we see something that's, you know, I've never tried acorn bread or I've never tried acorn tortillas, you know, those kinds of things, let's do it, you know? Let's modernize the food that we have to have it as a staple type thing. So that's kind of my, my thought. The acquired taste is so important. <laughs> And, and sharing that with our youth. Um, I remember we were in eighth grade, we were at the sea around our sea world or undersea world or whatever in Crescent City. And my mom was a van driver for the transportation. And she was all, oh yeah, some of the local Native Americans eat sea anemone. And I was all, ew. I told my mom, I'm like, who eats sea anemone? She's all, uh, we do, that's Duma. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't even know it was sea anemone. I just only knew it by the Talawa word. And so that can that tells you how much, you know, we have that whole relationship going on there. And I want that to be a relationship that might, you know, that carries on. Like we were just talking about how, how vital and important it is to have these connections and, and just the, even the spiritual aspects of, you know, giving that thanks when you're taking that life of that berry, when you're, when you're right there in that intentional picking of it is so profound and important. Um, I, I love that my youth, my kids are getting older. So we're having these discussions during our time of canning because we were up till 2.30 last night canning salmon. That we got 10 fish and just got them on the smoker and had to process them down and I said well you know we just talk about all these different things and so I'm liking the interest in it and so I'm thinking that the best way is to get in touch with people who are involved in it and I'm willing to take people out and share what I know you know I'm, I'm not saying I know everything but I, I'm willing to share what I do know um, I know our fish camp's been a nice spot every year because we haven't had any uh, loss in that connection to dry and fish I mean it was a common practice up and down the coast clear down to Pomo country for all of our people. And so um, I consider that like a dying art and we don't want it to be a dying art. We want it to be a, a living, thriving connection. And so there's protocols that we go through with, the, with that camp and um, sharing that with our youth and our kids is so, is so profound. Um, I'm just loving that that's being built in, you know, the youth that come there. Um, we've opened it up and uh, shared net making there. Um, we make sand bread down there. We incorporate acorns in our sand bread. Um, we were thinking about an idea of sharing, you know, putting some traditional or in a traditional method, the sand bread as a, as a, as a thing. And then also, um, you know, dried surfish at the beach when we, how we do it down there and just talking about the process of it and everything. And, um, you know, dried fish is an acquired taste too. It, it is really tasty, but you have to have an acquired taste to it. Cause some people are like, oh, this is, you know, whatever they make their comments, but, and it's being really respectful to people and that, uh, seeking of knowledge is really important too. Um, holding that um, place for that exchange of the information is um, vital. Um, my my thoughts on where to start, um, kind of combined on what everyone said, um, I haven't already said, it starts with, I guess, taking care of, like I said earlier, taking care of like our resources. So when we are practicing these um, harvesting methods, um, like, you know, um, not over harvesting deer in one night, you know, why would you need to take four deer home when you um, can, can't even process that much or, you know, um, kind of same with sturgeon and that's my opinion, but like, who, who needs five sturgeon in a boat? That's not right, but same with like huckleberries, you know, pick them right. Um, just don't over harvest things because then that 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 won't be able to come back next year if you over harvest. And then the second part is um, kind of maybe if you're kind of like some people who have have has started out, like they've asked me questions like, um, how do I um, start something if I don't have a plot of land and I could grow food but I want to grow it in my house? I'm like, there's different little um, cilantro and basil things you could grow in your house or um, something on your doorstep. So like, I think for our on our sake, our end of it is being very open. Um, information is key. Like we're talking about knowledge. 
if I had all this information and never told anyone about it and never shared anything, then I didn't do my job and I didn't, my purpose, that wasn't, that's not my purpose. My purpose is to learn and um, teach people who didn't have the opportunity as me, who didn't have the opportunity to go to um, school and running into a bunch of conferences and stuff who um, didn't, wasn't able, to, wasn't able to do that. My purpose now is to come back to home, teach what I learned, whether it be um, unorthodox or not, um, um, just being an open book. Um, but other than that, like, like I said, I think a lot of people started this year. You don't have to be an expert. I'm not even an expert. Um, I just like to think I am, but I'm not. And then um, they, but like, just like try and get, you know, um, um like if you do have a plot of land it starts with low soil and like you know you need your nitrogen some type of some type of nitrogen um and just plant and like i said i don't th i think if you had a garden that you just went and watered and went back inside come versus a garden that you talked to maybe sang to and like you know checked in on multiple times a day the garden that you talk to um is going to do better so um you know it comes to respect um like Marva was saying, like take, being able, if you take these berries and stuff, like really appreciate that because it's it's kind of crazy how you could just go out in your backyard and be provided with a deer or a salmon. I didn't, it took me a long time until I moved here in Colorado to, sh I didn't, I mean, I kind of did, but salmon, salmon is really like lavish. It's like a luxury thing. Like I seen uh, Arcadis Farmer's Market, like a little piece of filet that big um $22 I'm like what I've never had that's crazy like I would not buy if, um something I could get out the brush dance for $22 but anyway it's like learning learning that um but that's why that's where the whole sovereignty comes in I, I was able to go catch my um, fish give thanks to it learn how to can it and now I could eat fish in Colorado because I'm not gonna buy a fish in Colorado like some people do but anyways, um, it comes down to respect. Um, just reach out to any one of us, whoever's listening to this and are interested about food. Each one of these people I know for a fact would give any part of their day to be like, oh yeah, um, go to this place to get a start or go to this place. Oh, here's a place that's actually giving free seats. Like it's all this, this whole talk of this community is really cool. Like when I seen Jude up in, um, when we we're, um, helping with the dance house I was like we were just caught up and he like he like his social media um, input was true to him like he always sends me these books or this nutrition facts so I'm like it's all music to my ears so like I don't know this community of being able to talk share stories and stuff I think it's really cool I think this food uh, even though I'm going in school for an environmental studies and even though that that actually so I'm, I wanted to do, be more food focused maybe nutrition focused but I'm going to school environmental studies, which is I'm more going to focus about water. And, but actually, I want to, I would say like, oh, I'm bummed out, but that is food security, you know, taking care of our forests and stuff. Like at this natural resource symposium back in February in Hoopa, Nolan um, was the key speaker and he talked about fire. He really made, he, we need more fire and it's, so I was at a natural resource um, symposium to talk about food. And at first I kind of felt out of place, like, Here's all these people talking about dams, water, turtles, fire, all this stuff and fish. And I'm like, over here talking about a garden. But in the same sense, food sovereignty is natural resources. It's being able to take care of these trees, um, slimming down some of these firs so our acorns could breathe better. Um, so the, our wood wardia and yerba um, buena could come back. So these things shouldn't be rare things. That we need to take care of our land. So it starts. So to get started, it starts with you um, and your choices. Do you want to uh, make your life better? Do you want to make your kids' lives better, your future kids' lives better? That's what I'm kind of doing it, you know. Um, I've had a food um, roller coaster throughout my life, but I want to be able to, all my kids know is um, um, eating good. And I want them to know what kale is at the age of five. I didn't know what kale was at age of five, but like just like these things that, are really good for you I want them to be like oh yeah let's I'll eat a beet or something so anyways um it starts with you and um I think we really need this and we need to continue this and it's it's the most important thing in our not only our community but society and world so um thank you
Yeah, I think that's a great point that people have made, you know, just, um, you know, my advice also would be to get started, you know, and just, just go for it. You know, if it's something that's intriguing you, um, research it, talk to, reach out to us, you know, or, or like on personal levels or whatever, but, you know, there, reach out to your community, reach out to, you know, that's how I got started. You know, my, my uncle Awok Chetty McCovey was like a big, big factor in my life for, you know, this kind of, um, this topic, right. Um, of food sovereignty. He's the one that taught me how to smoke fish and how to smoke eels and how to, you know, take care of deer meat and like things like that. And so, um, and then I've also gotten a lot of input along the way too. You know, he kind of gave me a, a a foundation uh, and a really solid foundation, but like I always learn wherever I go, um, you know, there's a lot of knowledge out there. Um, and, and that like, that's what we've been talking about is like, that's what it means to us is that, that connection to community. So reach out to your community, um, reach out to your elders, reach out, you know, to the people and don't be afraid. You know, I think that's what we're kind of saying is like, don't be afraid. Uh, don't feel like oh this is something that I should know and I don't but you know just if you're interested just to do it yeah Bubba thank you um I really you know enjoy the work uh, that you've been doing and and food sovereignty and and you know sharing yeah you're always been you know one to share your food and your bounty so I appreciate mm -hmm. that um the one thing I just wanted to touch on is like so the spiritual side of things, I, when we do our ceremonies, uh, that always uplifts me when, you know, you know we're at deer skin dance, we're, we're calling everything to come back, you know, that, that, that kind of another, another reminder of like that, that, that spiritual side of, of our food. And um, so that, that's just, just, just these conversations are just reminding me of that and how we just have that spiritual connection to our food. Yeah, I also yeah, got to give you a... Nice. Oh, sorry, Shoshone. It's okay. I just wanted to thank you guys for all your guys' input that you have in here. I think it's super cool. It, it also is like, it has that family connection. You know, my, my daughter, she just turned nine. But last year when she was eight, you know, she went and took her own money, bought her mushrooming boots because, you know, when she would go out, you know, she wanted to have a good pair to go up the mountain and she was, you know, stoked about that. And so just that connection to family, to spirituality and, and to the environment is so important. Um, but before we end today, I just wanted to mention to the viewers that our next episode is going to be on berry processing on September 25th at 2 p.m. So um, make sure you mark your calendars and join us there. Um, and we're going to have, you know, we're trying to um, incorporate as many um, panelists um, as possible into our upcoming episodes. So it gives you more opportunity to engage and ask questions and really be able to pull from this knowledge base so I just want to thank you guys for joining us today and Bubba do you have anything to wrap us up um just want to thank you guys you know um I was gonna to say to Jude and Potawat Garden you know you guys kind of gave me a, a, a solid foundation too with um you know, the, the farming side of things and learning to grow my own foods in that way too. Um, and so that's a great resource here. Um, I know it's kind of smoky right now, but um, if you have free time, once this, once this kind of craziness clears out, you know, they always need help out there at the garden. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to thank you guys again and appreciate you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Look, looking forward to some more. Yeah, thank you. And it was really nice since I'm over here in Colorado to be in a panel of people back home that I know and care about. So thank you guys. Shanine Lankwiti. <laughs>